Also, happy Father's Day. Just thankful for each one of the, the fathers that, that are here. Uh, your, your part within your family, but also your part within God's family. Uh, very thankful that, that you are here. As I think about my, myself, uh, the importance, yes, of my, my own dad with my, my spiritual walk, my spiritual life, but also how many dads within the churches that I have been a part of that have been just so good in, in helping me to grow uh, so often in the way they lived as well as the, the things that they taught as well, and just so thankful. And your, your role is just so important. So Father's Day, and I guess whenever it's Father's Day, we, we just assume that, uh, as I am this morning, that I need to use a, a sports illustration. I'm not sure where that comes from, uh, because that's not from my family. My dad is not a, a sports enthusiast. My granddads were not sports enthusiasts that, uh, either, but it just kind of seems to be one of those things that we connect to as people, uh, not just men, but as people, but also it gives us just a lot of neat things. There are a lot of good lessons we can learn from sports and people that have been and that are in sports. Good things as well as some bad things. But this one comes from a few years ago and I've shared it before and some of you all know it from when it took place. It was a few years ago when the New York Mets was playing the Atlanta Braves and they Basically, the, the Braves were at bat. They, they had uh, runners on first base and also on third. Up to pitch was Dave Cohn. And for a lot of you, you know the illustration already. Dave Cohn was pitching for the, the Mets. He pitched and Mark Limke hit, hit his pitch. And it went between first and second base. And so Dave Cohn being the, the pitcher did what he was supposed to do. He went to the first base to, to cover it. The ball came to him. He caught the ball, and Mark Lemke ran to, to the, the base and, and ran across, and he was called safe. Because what had happened is Dave Cohn did not touch the bag, but he thought he had. And he just snapped. It wasn't typical for him. Uh, it wasn't typical for him at all, all, but he snapped that day, and he just started arguing. And as he argued, uh, he has his back towards the infield. And remember, there's already two people on basis. And so as he is arguing with the umpire, Charlie Williams, he, he gets in the face of the umpire, and he keeps arguing, and all the time, the game's still going, okay, just because... Uh, he has an argument that the, the game didn't quit because of that. Everybody else sees what is happening. The guy on first is moving. The guy on, on third is, is coming in toward, towards home, but he continues to argue, and he's holding the ball. His players, one of them is trying to get his attention. Another one tries to smack the ball out of his hand so that he could do something uh, because the game is still going. And it went for a while. The... Uh, the Braves, they scored two runs uh, during that whole event. One of uh, Cone's teammates tells him, you got to get your head back into the game, but he just continues to, to argue. So the Mets lost the game, okay, because of this event. Dave Cone then realized really what was taking place, and he was embarrassed, okay? He's embarrassed for a lot of reasons. One is this is the big thing that you know about him. He was a good ball player, did a lot of great things, but this is, you ever look him up, go to YouTube, you will see uh, what took place there because he will live on and on and on because of one time he got angry and he didn't keep his head in the game and it cost him the game. And he said this, he says, I snapped. It cost us the game and it's all my fault. Now, before we criticize Dave Cohn too much, we need to also take personal responsibility. Have you ever had one of those times that you had your head in the game, but that your head didn't stay in the game? And for whatever was taking place, and it may be more important than baseball, that day, that day you lost because you did not have your 
get in the game. Sometimes anger can do that. Sometimes we can uh, hurt or destroy a relationship or relationship that we have spent years to build from one time, right? One time of getting angry, we can destroy so much, right? So much. Because maybe we have our head in the game all the time except that time and the damage that is done. As parents, we understand that, don't we? That sometimes with all the things that need to be done, we get preoccupied by making a living, all the things that need to be done. And sometimes then we blow it as far as parenting. That, that sometimes over something pretty petty, we can kind of blow it. Maybe it, it turns to screaming and yelling. Uh, and what we're doing is hurting a relationship that is really what is the most important. And it can happen so easily. Sometimes because we're tired, sometimes because we're busy. I remember back, we were living at Pleasant Hill at the time, and our boys were, were little at the time, uh, had to be really little because uh, they, they were both preschool. And I'm not sure what it was about. It was one evening, and it had to do with Brennan. I don't even remember the event of what caused the, the problem, but I kind of lost it with him. Okay, I was not happy with that little guy. He's just a little preschooler at the time. And, and I'm not sure if I was tired, if I just missed the point, but I didn't have my head in the game. And so I just really raked this little guy over the coals, and I could see it within him. He melted. And he left. And then I melted. I go, man, I really blew it. So I went to go find him, and we had a playroom at the, the time in, in that house, and in the playroom, we had kind of like a refrigerator box or something like that that we had made into a little playhouse with windows, a door, and stuff, and I looked around. I couldn't find him, and he was inside the little playhouse in one of the corners just sitting. This little tiny guy, he was crushed. And so I crawled in there with him, and so I, I apologized. But it was so neat what happened. He changed just like that. He was back happy again. He jumped up and started playing. And I'm so thankful that even though I didn't have my head in the game, my head got back in the game. I'm not sure if he even remembers the, the situation. I sure do. But I'm so thankful that my head got back in the game that I didn't hurt a relationship or, or cause something that, that stayed there. But it just disappeared whenever I told that little preschooler that, you know, I did wrong. I didn't have a reason to get angry. And he just changed like that. How neat. I'm so thankful I got my head back in the game. It's so easy to do. Sometimes because we're tired. Sometimes because there's so much. And, and sometimes it's just because of life. But we have to keep our head in the game. Sometimes we as churches, we do it too. As we, we think about, sometimes we, we focus on some internal issue, and not that it doesn't have any merit, but when you look at the big picture, sometimes it is so small when we think of a world that's going to hell, right? A world that's going to hell, and sometimes we, we really focus and put everything in on something that's just really not that important. Not that it's not important at all, but... We need to always think, what would Jesus do? What is Jesus' emphasis? What is the target? Right? And keep our head in the game. We need to keep our head in the game. But see, we don't have eyes in the back of our heads. Right? We, we just don't. Just like Dave Cohn. He, he couldn't see what was taking place on the field when he was arguing with the, the umpire. That a lot of things were still going. The world was still taking place. The game was still being played. Because his focus was in one place. And he had the wrong focus. And so he lost the game that day. And it's so easy for us when we totally focus on one thing. It always means that means we're not focusing upon something else. 
So we have to, to really keep looking at, am I focusing on what's the most important? Right? Because we can't see everything, just like we can't be, be at every place at one time, just like Dave Cohn couldn't be focused and in the face of the umpire arguing with him and also see everything else that was taking place. We're, we're the same way. When we concentrate upon one thing, other things go unnoticed. So we need to really keep our head in the game that I, I'm looking at least most of the time to really what's the most important. I've had a lot of fun over the years with hunting. And it, especially with deer hunting, uh, taking my nephews out and my sons out and, and teaching them how to, to deer hunt. Uh, just a, a lot of fun times. Uh, being out in the, the deer stand and uh, for one of my nephews, Andrew, uh, he was a little guy when I took him out. I'd never been able to take him out when he had an actual gun. Okay, he was little. We was just on the process of starting uh, this. So a lot I was teaching him part of how you just sat still uh, for a long period of time. And so a lot of what we did was just sat there uh, spitting sunflower seeds is a, a lot of it. But it's fun teaching them how to hunt. It's the same way when I help uh, going out with wounded warriors. Uh, some of these guys that, oh, they, they knew guns. Uh, but the aspect, they had never been out deer hunting before and just teaching them that you go in and first of all, just relax, okay? Because I can remember when I first go, went out deer hunting. I was all tense. I was holding my gun all day long, sometimes then the next day, the next day. You're so tense. And, and my, when I would come in, my eyes would just burn because I'm not even blinking like I should be because I am so much trying to see if a deer is out there. And so you're just wore out from doing nothing because you're so tense. I would just tell, especially those wounded warriors, first of all, just put your gun down, okay? Because the deer's not going to shoot back, Okay? They, they, they had a whole different situation that they were used to. Just relax. Have it where you can get it, but just relax. And like I said, you don't have to look at everything because God made us kind of neat. You know, I can see clear back here right now. I don't have to focus there. I can see there. So you'll see when a deer comes out, okay? So just take it easy. And you'll know when they're there. And it makes it so much easier. And then... When there's a deer, focus on the deer. Then focus where you need to be shooting that deer. As I, I taught uh, my son Brennan, I think it was the first time he was out, is the evening that my dad and I, we knew where the deer were, and so we drove them out to my son's. And then all of a sudden, we heard, uh, bang, 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 bang. Okay, he emptied his gun. Okay, he had an SKS, so you can empty that pretty pretty, pretty quick. And, and we, we went out there, and... And Brennan got a deer. And so I had to ask him, said, Brennan, is that the one you were trying to hit? He said, I wasn't trying to hit any. I was just shooting at him, okay? He was fortunate enough. There were seven. They were close enough together. He, he happened to get one, but that's not typically the way it is. You, you have to focus. You have to focus. You have to aim. And, and, and this is how, how you accomplish those, those things. That so often... You know, if, if we don't focus in, we have a lot of misses, okay? We see a lot of deer. We make them run to the neighbors. Uh, but a lot, a lot of these aspects, that sometimes we miss things in life because we focus in the wrong direction. I read this illustration about a guy that he was at the funeral of King George VI of England. And said it was one of those big events, as we can think about, whenever they do something big with the king or queen, it's going to be a pretty big event there in England. And it was for, for the funeral, that as they had the funeral procession go through London, people were there from every place. Because remember, royalty and, and heads of state from a lot of places there, and people just flocked in. And so it was a long procession that, that took place. And this guy said that, Whenever they had the, the wagon with the, the, the king's body on it, the casket, that alongside the casket came along the king's dog. His name was Caesar. And so just kind of trotting along uh, with the procession. But said, when it got close to him, there was a dog that came out of the, the crowd, okay? And, and 
Caesar really didn't like that dog being there, and that dog didn't like Caesar being there. And so it was kind of this dog skirmish that took place. And he says, while I was watching the two dogs, he says, at least five kings went by, okay? That sometimes it is so easy for us to focus in what's really not the most important, that we miss the big things. We tune into the trivial And we miss the important. We give our devotion, our energy to lesser things. And we forget what is most important, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And sometimes within things within our lives, he passed by without us ever even seeing Jesus there. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our head in the game. And so we must focus on the right things. It doesn't mean we, we, we are bad people. That's not what we're talking about. See, Dave Cohn wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't a bad player. In fact, he had a good career. But every decision, when we include, also excludes. So if we focus on Jesus, it does exclude some things. But he's the king of kings and lord of lords. What, what better or who better can I focus on than he? That other things probably aren't going to be a part of my life. I don't have to worry about because I'm focusing upon him. There's a little story that I, I read about back during the, the days of the Depression. As our country was going through what we call the Great Depression, as I had a guy tell me back years ago, said, I went through it. I don't see anything great about it. It's great because it was a big depression, uh, not because it was a good time. That a lot of the roads were, were not good even before the Depression. That a lot of our roads weren't gravel roads. They were dirt roads and, and just uh, all over the place. And then there was no money for any care whatsoever for, for those roads. And on one of those roads... Uh, there was a sign that says, choose your ruts carefully because you will be in them for the next 20 miles. Okay? I kind of like that. Uh, Sometimes you probably feel like you live on one of those roads, right? Uh, That, you know, choose your your ruts carefully. And that is important for us. Choose our ruts carefully because we are probably going to be in it. It's probably going to have an effect for a long time. For Dave Cohn, it's lasted beyond his career. The one thing. That took place. One of my favorite books is called The Principle of the Path. I really like it. It's a simple book, probably one of the best counseling books, even though it's not a counseling book, that you can have from a Christian perspective. And it's the idea that that every path leads to a destination. So figure out where you want to go, and then you choose the path accordingly. Now that makes sense, right? Uh, We see that in a lot of things in in life, that I need to see where I want to be, and you choose the path. And so for us as a Christian, I I want Jesus. I want to live with him for all of eternity, and so I choose that path. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so it really helps me a lot because this is my, my destination, so I stay on that path. So a lot of things don't fit the path, okay? So it makes it easier in making choices that this really doesn't fit, or even if I choose something and then I say, wow, that doesn't fit following Jesus Christ, it helps me to get back on the path again. And and it's really important. Choose your path carefully. What do you want? What do we want? And for our followers of Jesus Christ, our eyes are fixed upon him. We want him. So we, we choose that way. Also, some neat books, especially for for young guys. There's a book, it's been out a few years, called Killing Lions. Uh, It's by John Eldridge, but also his son, Sam. Uh, Sam, it it just goes through a lot of questions that young men would go through. The rest of the stuff for for men, John Eldridge's books are, are some of the best, in my opinion, in just helping men of all ages. If you're a young guy of 10, or if you're a guy of 80, Eldridge's books are good from a Christian perspective in helping us to understand Christian manhood. And so there he is helping to see killing lions, just how to be on that path and how to get to your destination. It makes a lot of sense. 
And so us as fathers, that are part of what we are helping if it's our children, but also young people within our lives. That a lot of times we may not be the, the father, but sometimes we're spiritual fathers or spiritual brothers to, to different ones within our, our lives. And so how can I help? Okay, how can I help? A lot of y'all probably don't know that most Sunday mornings, as I'm here a little bit early, not early compared to a lot of others that get here about the same time, uh, the, the worship team, they, they practice. And I'm so thankful. Why do they practice? Not to give a good performance, but to be ready for worship and to lead us in worship. And it's quite obvious that they are ready for that and so thankful for that. But where Jason and his family are here uh, for that and have been for years, uh, there's one in their, their, their family that a lot of times doesn't play a part up here, and that's Cody, okay? And so what does Cody do uh, during the time when everybody else is practicing? We have had a, a thing for a long time, Cody and I, that he comes and we go to my office, even back when the office was back in, when the a room was back there, and we would have what is called story time, okay? He asked me this morning, can we have story time, okay? And we don't always have it every Sunday now, but we go back, and it first started with, with me taking a picture that I have in the office or, or some other stuff that I have there and just telling him a story. And then it's his turn to tell me a story. Now, usually, we visit and we play with little motorcycles. That's what we do anymore. But there's a reason. There's a reason because I want to influence him the, the most I can, okay? Not that he doesn't have other good influences, but it never hurts to have one more, okay? That maybe sometime within his life, he might come and ask me a question that's important, really important, that from those story times, that being a spiritual friend, father, uncle, grandpa, great-grandpa, I don't know, uh, that's there can be that influence. And I think we need to look for those opportunities that sometimes we have to start in helping people to see the destination they want. And that's what we do with kids. We're helping them to pick a destination and then the path to stay on as well. And how important that is. Priorities are so important for us to make sure that we are looking at what is permanent and not just the temporal uh, things uh, and, and just how important that is. The Apostle Paul, as we have a lot of the New Testament as God speaks through the Apostle Paul, and Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Boy, isn't it easy to, to live a whole week and, wow, I just lived in the temporary. Okay? I just li have lived in the temporary this whole, the, the, this whole week that I never really thought about anything that's really permanent. It's easy. It's easy. That's why God has given us some of those markers as we are here right now to, to help us to focus again, fix our eyes upon Jesus. So what it helps is when I fix my eyes on Jesus, it helps me on the path to get to the destination. Fix my eyes. If we're only looking at the temporary, temporary is just temporary. But what about the permanent? He also wrote this to the church at Philippi. He had, says, have your minds dwell he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received and heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and, of, and the God of peace will be with you. So like he said, what, what is really important we need to focus upon these things, what is really important, because it's so easy because a lot of things that are to be in our lives really aren't the most important. They're not the destination, okay? They're just a part of traveling here upon this earth that everybody does. But I need to think about what is the best. 
fixing my eyes on Jesus Christ. See, Dave Cohn missed it that day. Uh, he was sure he had the foot, his foot on the back. He felt he needed to argue his case, but it cost him the game. That he's so focused upon his personal injustice that he miss, missed the fact that the game was still going and other people were still running. The most important. It may have been a Sunday afternoon in Rome. Some Christians went to, to visit a friend that was in jail. They were admirers of this man, which was the Apostle Paul. And they, they went in because they heard some things that they didn't like. But they really liked the Apostle Paul. And so they felt like they probably needed to go tell Paul because probably something needed to be done about these people. So we read about that in, in Philippians, that they go to tell Paul that he said, you know, there, there's people talking bad about you, Paul. Oh, they're Christians, and, they, and they're preaching the gospel, but they are saying, really, Paul deserves to be in jail. And so they're trying to get, okay, what is Paul going to say? Is he going to get mad? Is he, is he going to get angry? Is there a way we can take revenge? Are we going to ban them that they could never preach again? And in Philippians 1, 1, 2, this was Paul's answer to these people that really were concerned, but they had the wrong focus. Paul says, what does it matter? Okay, what does it matter? The important thing that is Christ is being preached, whether from false motives or true. So, so Paul says, they're preaching. That's the important thing. If they're talking bad about me, that's not the most important thing. Paul never got things confused. It wasn't about him. It's about Jesus. Let him uplift Christ. That's what's the most important. If they had their eyes fixed on Christ, let them keep their eyes fixed on Christ. It's not about me, and let's not start some war that takes place that then takes our eyes up off, off of Jesus and puts it on me. Right? Paul had the right idea. And that's why he... Right after that, he continues that letter, kind of in that same frame, because of that situation and another situation that was taking place within the church at Philippi. He says, therefore. And the therefore in chapter 2 is a yes, therefore. Okay? When we say therefore, it's a maybe. In the Greek, there's maybe, yes, and no, therefores. And this is a yes, therefore. He says, yes, there is encouragement by being united with Christ. Yes, there's comfort from his love. Yes, we have a common sharing of the Spirit. Yes, there is tenderness and compassion. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and one of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you looking to the interests of the others. And then he uses Jesus as the illustration, but he had just used himself. When others said, Paul, you're pretty important. You're an apostle, and people are talking bad about you. I'm not the point. There's oneness, and we find that oneness in Christ. What really matters and what really is important are two terrific questions to answer. What really matters and what really is important. See, winning the game was, should have been more important than arguing over a point, right? When it comes to baseball. Always looking to the bigger picture. Now, I'm not sure how many times I've seen a lot of the Andy Griffith show, okay? I've seen some of them so many times that, you know, I'd hate to count, uh, I can give you kind of almost the, the dialogue that, that's taken place. But I really like the show. Well, Andy and Barney was on it afterwards. It wasn't worth watching, but okay. Because there, something really important always was being taught. Andy was the sheriff that knew everybody to the extent he could take th care of things in the town almost always, even without ever carrying a gun. <laughs> Only time he ever carried a gun was when there was a problem because of outsiders, right? 
That's part of it. Because you see some things, some traits with Andy that's pretty important. And then when it comes to his best friend, his, his deputy, Barney, that was always bumbling something, always messing up. But Andy believed in Barney. Most others didn't believe in Barney, but Andy always did. He, he stood beside him. And he always gave him the benefit of the doubt. And even when Andy did something that brought even the whole show, the whole occasion to, to a good conclusion... A lot of times, Barney took the praise, right? But that was all right with Andy. It didn't matter, okay? It didn't matter. He was showing us a lot of things. He was showing what, what matters that show was, what's really important. Friendship, loyalty, encouragement. He placed Barney above himself. That's what Philippians is talking about. Placing others above. Is it really so important that we prove that we're right? Do you hang in there until you've won the argument but lost the friend? That's sometimes developing grudges that don't even need to be there. Well, he wronged me. Probably true. He did it on purpose. That's probably true. A lot of court battles take place just because of that. Back when I was living in, in Illinois, we had a court case. And it was from two people I knew from, from our town. One of the ladies had started going to church, and, and she and her neighbor lady, they, they fought all the time. Not over anything big and not really anything that had ever been done but it was perceiving, okay? There was jealousy. There was all sorts of things. And because this will be online, I won't tell you too much information, okay? I don't want to go to court either. Uh, but I went with the lady uh, when she went to court. I told her, said, I'm not there as a, a character witness, anything else. I'm just there as a Christian wanting you to do the right thing. But it was interesting watching that whole court case. The judge for this uh, case was not the, the normal judge. The other one was on vacation, so he had come in. And it was interesting when they were trying to get a, a jury because everybody knew both, okay? They were friends. And so this one said, well, I know this and this. And so all, all, all these people, and there was so much tension because it brought a whole community in over something that really didn't matter to anybody because it wasn't real things that was taking place. It was all, I feel this, I think this. And so the, the, whole, the whole community was going to, to court because most of them liked both of the ladies. But they finally got the jurors. They were going through and bringing up witnesses after witness, and, and it was one of those things that, what is this even about, Okay. This would never make Perry Mason or anything like that. And eventually the judge, he turned to the jurors and he says, I hate to do this to you all. Because he says, I, 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 I trust people. I trust the, the jury. But says, I'm not, not going to let this go to you. We're wasting your time. And then he said to the two ladies, you just need to go back home and learn to be neighbors. And you could just feel the tension disappear within that whole courthouse because everybody had all this tension because, man, we're going to cause all this problem if we side with this, if we side with this. And, but it just the judge did such a good job. Just go back home and, and be neighbors. Focus upon what you need to be focusing upon. How important to focus upon the real things. See, what causes us to win in the long run if we keep our eyes fixed upon the right things? The Bible says, and you know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and called according to his purposes. So follow the right things. Life is simply too short for the small. Dave Cohn 
could have used that advice that day. We need to look at the things that are important for the long run, keeping our eyes focused upon that. That doesn't mean we, we don't focus on short, short term, that we're not a part of it, but looking at the real objects that we are to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. Keeping our eyes fixed upon him. As Paul writes to the church at Corinth as we get ready to the end this morning, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow uh, to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified by, uh, from the prize. So as Paul says, run the race. Keep our eyes fixed. Be a disciple, one that is being disciplined as we are on the path wanting the destination of eternity with God. So as the worship team comes up the, this morning to, to lead us, let's keep our heads, our hearts, our passions in the game. And I guess the last question is, are you in the game? Are you in the game? Let's be in the game because we want the prize. But also we want others to get the prize too, right? We want others to have the prize of Jesus Christ. So let's keep our eyes fixed upon him.